I've kind of retitled this, still under myth in the human story, the meaning of, of the myth and its final denouement. Yesterday morning, what I tried to do was, as Lewis called it, tease out the mythical radiance that rests upon the gospel. I thought later about that movie, Pirates of the Caribbean, and um, you know, that encounter in which the young lady didn't believe in ghosts, and the ghost says, well, you gotta start believing why, because you're in a ghost story. Well, there's a sense in which I thought, we're in a myth. We are a living myth, if you will, we have mythical significance. Tolkien, Tolkien understood this. In fact, it's the lenses through which he interpreted reality. And um, a little story he wrote called Leaf by Niggle. In that little story, he tried to tease some of this out. It's one of the most marvelous things I think Tolkien ever wrote. It's existence today is not well known. Few people actually read it. But this is very, very unfortunate. And the reason is, is because in this little story, Tolkien brings together his sense of art and theology with a beauty and an economy that's not found anywhere else in his writing. It is less than 7,500 words from beginning to end. And it exemplifies his ideas of sub-creation and this, this term he coined eucatastrophe. And they're explained in his essay on fairy stories. In brief, sub-creation refers to the art of creating another world with such a degree of inner consistency of reality that it creates in the reader the kind of belief that we give to the real world. He called it secondary belief. So that, <clears throat> for example, while you're in Middle Earth, it's real and you believe it as long as you're in the story because it is so consistent. It gives you that feel, that taste, that texture of reality. This creative impulse Tolkien believed was the mark of the image of God in humanity. That mythic mark that rests upon all of us. Quote, he says, I tried to show allegorically how that might come to be taken up into creation in some plane in this little story, Leaf by Niggle. To make visible and physical the effects of sin or misuse of free will by men. Now, you catastrophe, which if you understand Eucharist, which is to give thanks, catastrophe, it is the catastrophe for which we give thanks. And he draws it right from the Lord's table. Every Sunday, Lewis would come and celebrate the catastrophe for which we give thanks. It's been said that Christianity is the only religion that celebrates the humiliation of its God. That is the Lord's table. We give thanks for this because out of it comes the healing of the old wound. More about that in a moment. He talks about this notion of eucatastrophe. He says it's a sudden and miraculous grace that in the midst of much sorrow and failure denies universal final defeat. In other words, hope. Hope is always sustained, always retained. And it's retained because of this notion of eucatastrophe. And he actually says it is the, the central ingredient, uh, ingredient in all good fairy stories. It's that sudden inbreaking of grace that changes everything from there on out, but it's unexpected. It provides, he says, an example of even Gellium. That is, quote, a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant is grief. And by referring to this fleeting glimpse of joy as evangelium, which is the Latin word for gospel, Tolkien would have us understand that the true significance of eucatastrophe is ultimately not to be found in its fairy tale setting, but in our world. 
In the epilogue on fairy stories, Tolkien shared his belief that this idea was at the very heart of the Christian gospel, and he actually apologizes. He finishes this big essay, and he comes to this epilogue, and he says, I really shouldn't do this because I'm not a theologian, but I can't help it. And he says, I would venture to say that approaching the Christian story from this direction, that is the eucatastrophe, it has long been my feeling that God redeemed the corrupt-making creatures men in a way fitting to this aspect. The gospel contains a fairy story, a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. They contain many marvels in a peculiar way, artistic, beautiful, and moving in their mythical perfection, self-contained significance. And among the marvels is the greatest and the most complete conceivable eucatastrophe. But this story has entered history and into our primary world. The desire and the aspiration of sub-creation, that is us, has been raised to the fulfillment of creation. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. And this story begins and it ends in joy. And any story that is connected to the primary world must end in joy. But that joy is also a joy that's won through what he calls discatastrophe. Now, Lewis understood that this notion of the incarnation was also the centerpiece of this myth that we call the human story. This myth that is actually entered into our primary world. Lewis says that the incarnation was the central event in the history of the earth. He goes on in the book of miracles, but once the son of God drawn hither not by our merits but by our unworthiness has put on human nature, then our species does become in one sense the central fact in all nature. Our species, rising after its long descent, will drag all nature up with it. Why? Because in our species, the Lord of nature is now included. He says, God never undoes anything but evil and never does good to undo it again. Therefore, the union between God and nature in the person of Christ admits no divorce. He will not go out of nature again, and she must be glorified in all ways which this miraculous union demands. The incarnation illuminates and orders all other phenomena, explains both our laughter and our logic, our fear of the dead, and our knowledge that it is somehow good to die, at which at one stroke covers what multitudes of separate theories will hardly cover for us if this is rejected. And in the fictional count, Paralandra, every minute Ransom in this story is a saying, I, I became, it became clear to me, and in Paralandra is a retelling of the Eden story in the planet Venus, Paralandra. And Ransom, the main protagonist, is trying, in a sense, to get his mind around what was going on in this recapitulation of, of Eden in this other planet. He says it became clear to him that the parallel he had tried to draw between Eden and Paralandra was crude and imperfect. What had happened on Earth when Maleldil, that is the Christ figure, was born a man at Bethlehem, had altered the universe forever. He says, when God became man, the universe turned a corner. That is the central event of our human story. And it is the central event in all the great myths. At the center, again, and this is a thing that haunted Lewis for so long until Tolkien helped him make sense of it, is at the center of those myths was this notion of a dying God, a God sacrificing himself to himself, which he could never make sense of, could not grasp the meaning of, and Tolkien helped him put it together. Now, last night, what I tried to do is to take us into the Genesis story of creation, 
which is the very seed plot of the human story. It's the lens from which we're supposed to look at and interpret all of the human story. And I tried to do it in such a way as C.S. Lewis described to allow us to look along the beam, the mythic beam of human history as its proper starting point. And what we found was that life in its truest sense is echad, this notion of oneness and intimacy with God, with one another, and with the created order. But we also found the terrifying truth that we lost that oneness that defines us, that is the truest index of what it means to be human. In other words, we died that day. We lost that connectedness, which the scriptures describe as life. Aloneness is our death, a oneness is life. Theologian Paul Tillich astutely observed that aloneness is more true of man than of any other creature. He is not only alone, he also knows that he is alone. Aware of what he is, he asks the question of his lone aloneness. He asks why he is alone and how he can triumph over being alone. For his aloneness he cannot endure, neither can he escape it. It is his destiny to be alone and to be aware of it. This is the greatness and this is the burden of man. This, to put Tillich's observation into the language of the Bible, is man's death, the curse he must bear for the violation of Eden's echad. Having shared in the life of the triune God, alone all of creation knowing, alone of all creation, knowing the oneness that life is, having had that, none of the other created things had, we are now cursed with the knowing that we are alone. The animals don't know they're alone. We know we're alone because we once were not. Tolkien knew this truth as well and its central significance in the human story. And I want to quote a little bit more from a letter or a bit of the letter I quoted last night. He's writing a letter to his son Christopher. And he's thinking back about the Eden story and the pressure that he was under, that everybody was under to dismiss it as nothing but just religious hocus pocus. He says, and he's turning this around, he says, but partly as a development of my own thought on my lines and work, technical and literary, partly in contact with C.S. Lewis, and in various ways, not the least, the firm guiding hand of alma mater Ecclesia, I do not now feel either ashamed or dubious on the Eden myth. It is not, of course, historicity of the same kind as the New Testament, which are virtually contemporary documents. While Genesis is separated by we do not know how many sad, exiled generations from the fall. But certainly, there was an Eden on this very unhappy earth. We all long for it. We are constantly glimpsing it our whole nature at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most humane is all soaked with a sense of exile, lostness. And as far as we can go back, the nobler part of the human mind is filled with the thoughts of sib, peace, and goodwill, and with the thought of its loss. We long, we long for that to be healed. Lewis probably did this best in terms of describing this sense in his sermon, The Weight of Glory. And I want to read two excerpts from that sermon. When I attempted a few minutes ago to describe our spiritual longings, I was omitting one of their most curious characteristics. We usually notice it just as the moment of vision dies away, as the music ends, or as the landscape loses the celestial light. What we feel then has been well described by Keats as the journey homeward to habitual self. You know what I mean. For a few minutes, we had the illusion of belonging to that world. Now we wake 
to find that it was no such thing. We have been mere spectators. The habitual self journey back to self, we're alone. Beauty has smiled, but not to welcome us. Her face was turned in our direction, but not to see us. We have not been accepted, welcomed, or taken into the dance. We may go when we please, we may stay if we can, nobody marks us. A scientist may reply that since most of the things we call beautiful are inanimate, it is not very surprising that they take no notice of us. That, of course, is true. It is not the physical objects that I'm speaking about. But that indescribable something of which they become for a moment the messengers. Those moments that break into us, that create this longing for connectedness, and in a moment it's gone. The, and part of the bitterness which mixes with the sweetness of that message is due to the fact that it so seldom seems to be a message intended for us, but rather something we have just overheard. By bitterness, I mean pain, not resentment. We could hardly dare to ask that any notice be taken of ourselves, but we pine. The sense that in this universe we are treated as strangers, the longing to be acknowledged, to meet with some response, to bridge some chasm that yawns between us and reality is part of our inconsolable secret. And surely from this point of view, the promise of glory in the sense described becomes highly relevant to our deep desire. For glory meant good report with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last. Tolkien got at this at the very end of his story, The Lord of the Rings. He put it into a fictional account. But in this mythic journey, the journey is always to get back home. That is the deepest impulse in the human heart, to get back home. And that home is not just a place, it's connectedness, it's relationship. And it is my deep conviction that for Tolkien, the whole meaning of the Lord of the Rings comes in the very last sentence of the entire epic. If you remember, all these great things have happened. Terrifying things, beautiful things, wars. Serving one thing in Lewis's thinking. Those were always means to an end. That glory was not the end. The end was this. Mary and Pippin and Sam have just said goodbye to their dearest friend Frodo. And to the friends that they made, some of them, along their journey. And they're going back home. And it's quiet. But they're hobbits. And the indomitable spirit of a hobbit cannot be kept down for long. And pretty soon, they're chatting, they're laughing. And by the time they part, Merry and Pippin to go to their place and Sam back up to Hobbiton, they're singing. And as Sam comes up the road, he sees his home. And there's a light on. And he walks in. And Rosie, his wife, takes Eleanor, his daughter, puts him on Sam's lap, and Sam says, I'm back. That's what it's all about. That's the end of the journey. That's the denouement, this coming back and connectedness. And if any of you have read that story, when you've read that line, you close that book with a deep, deep sigh and longing. We're exiles. But as I showed last night, there is one who has come and entered into this story of ours, and he has healed the old wound. 
He has taken heaven and earth and he's brought them together in himself. He's taken humanity and God and he's brought them to himself. And on the cross, he healed that wound and offers us now to enter into that healing through participating in his own life. And what that gives us is hope. Um, oh, I've got it here. That was one of the remarkable things when the Lord of the Rings sort of took the American culture by storm. Frodo lives in, in, in subway places. Why? Because in the midst of this sort of post-modern darkness and ugliness comes this amazing story of hope. And Gabriel Facker, a retired theologian, from Andover Newton, reflecting on Paul Tillich's assessment of the mood of modern literature in the late 1960s, made an observation. Tillich's observation was this about the mood of modern literature in the 60s, that of the three states of mind reflected in current artistic expression, in hopelessness, foolish hope, and genuine hope, hopelessness by far prevailed, while artistic interpretations of genuine hope were rare. Now, commenting on this, Facker says, for a long time we have assumed that art is the most sensible barometer of the winds of an era. And if Tillich is right in his diagnosis, either today's new wave of hope is illusory or the art community has not yet caught up with contemporary reality. Or it may well be that the artistic weather vane must be sought on otter-looking barns where the conventional wisdom does not hold sway. There would be a nice bit of artistic irony if the best of art of an era was born in the unlikeliest of places, let us say, in some philologist's library. And here he's speaking of Tolkien. Instead of a left bank cafe, Paris. And had to do with the unlikeliest of material, let us say, of elves and ents rather than ids and angst. And indeed, we here nominate Oxford Don J.R.R. Tolkien with his hobbit world as a literary candidate for the cadre of modern hopers. We were tired, I remember that in the 60s, tired of all the gloom and doom and depictions of it and despair. And out of this comes this story that busts in and gives us hope. And that hope, my friends, is real because there is a final denouement. There is, in a sense, the ultimate healing of the old wound. As Lewis says, <laughs> one day we're going to get in. Now, Dr. Jensen referred to my imagination. I do, I have quite a lively, robust imagination. But I hope it's grounded in biblical truth. And as soon as I came to faith at 21 years old, I began reading and began to realize that the sort of hokey, what I call now, hoking descriptions of heaven were just pathetic. I said, where are they? Every depiction biblically of heaven is real and concrete and people are real people. Moses comes back and Elijah and they're Moses and Elijah. They're not ghosts, they're not cherubim, seraphim, angels. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. They're real places. Professor Trevor Hart was here just a couple of weeks ago and talked about the notion of time and eternity. He says, I can't imagine heaven without time because heaven is relationship. And relationship requires the sense that I talk, you talk. We go, we come back. There's a sense of time, of reality. I have a friend, Jim Harrell. I missed him a lot this past weekend. I was back in Wheaton for my son's birthday. I mean, birthday, wedding, goodness. <laughs> I'm getting tired. And Jim was my buddy there. He died three years ago. He had Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Normally you die within one or two years. He died, it took about six or seven. Great at the front end, really hard at the end because he couldn't move. 
But the longer this disease progressed, the more he became heavenly minded in a really, really good way. And one night we were talking about heaven. He was constantly prodding me with questions and pushing me and developing my thinking on heaven. And all of a sudden, boom, it came into my mind. I said, Jim, write this name down, Jerry Harden. He says, why? I says, because he's in heaven. I want you to meet him. He says, I can't take a piece of paper with me. I said, well, Jim, I mean, that's not the point. The point is, if you don't write it down, you're going to forget. I said, I'm serious. He says, I can't believe you're telling me this. I said, Jim, listen, unless I get hit by a truck or something, I mean, the chances are you're going to get there before me, right? And he says, yeah. And you really believe me that my buddy Jerry Harden from back in Oregon who died 15 years ago is there, right? Yeah. So if you're both there, it stands to reason you should be able to meet, right? He goes, I never thought of it that way. I said, good, write this name down because I have a message for him. I said, I don't know what Jerry knows or doesn't know up there, but he knows me and he knows I'm the only one cheeky enough to do this. What I want you to do is I want you to find this guy. And I want you to go up to him and I say, hey, Jim, my name is I, Jerry. My name is Jim Harrell. And we have a mutual friend, Chris Mitchell. And he has a message for you. He wants me to tell you that he loves you and he misses you, can't wait to see you. He wants you to know that Carol, that's his wife, is doing really well. And Natalie and Brian are doing well. And you're a grandpa. I don't know if he knows that. It doesn't matter, you see. Now the story goes on. Jim reads this book called Heaven from Randy Alcorn. Randy's an old friend from back in Oregon. So I connect, okay, Jim with Randy. Now when he's reading Randy's book, Jerry Harden is in this book on heaven, okay? Now I've already told him I want him to meet him in heaven and give him this message. So he, he emails Randy, goes, wow, Jerry Harden, Chris, Chris has talked about him. I got a message for him. Randy writes back, really, would you give me a, give this message to him too for me? <laughs> then Carol, his wife, finds out about it. Carol writes to Jim, would you please tell Jerry this? This guy had three messages to give to Jerry. <laughs> if that's not true, then let's just pack our bags and go home. I'm not just pretending. Jerry is really there, and my friend Jim is really there. And I'm one day going to see them again. In fact, Jim told me, he says, you know, after the initial sorts of greetings when you get here, you better watch your back, because I'm here. We used to play all kinds of practical jokes on one another. <laughs> what Lewis is trying to do in The Great Divorce is to say, that place there is more real, in a sense, than this place here. And if my engagement with my people here is real, then it's even more real in a sense there. Heaven is always more, never less, than what we can imagine. Looking at the human story through the lens that Genesis gives us and this great new catastrophe gives us hope that extends beyond the pitiless walls, as Tolkien says, of the world. Now, two final things. If you remember in The Two Towers, in a chapter called The Stairs of Carathungal, they've just entered Mordor, and Frodo is really burdened with the ring. And Sam, Sam, bless his heart, is always trying to find some hope in the middle of darkness. And he starts thinking about what's happened to him. And he says, man, if we would have known what was going to happen, we probably wouldn't have left the safety of Rivendell. But he says, you know, but that's the way it is in all the stories. People just find themselves landing in them. And he says, the only ones you know or remember are those who just go on. They don't stop and go back, but they go on. And who knows what kind of end they're going to have, a good end, bad end, we don't know. And as he's thinking about stories, all of a sudden he remembered a story in Rivendell 
a story that took place in the first age of Middle Earth. Now you have to realize in Lewis's epic story, they're in about the year 3000 of the third age of Middle Earth, Frodo and Samar. This event took place thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years earlier in the first age of Middle Earth, Baron. Baron goes in under the satanic figure Morgoth and steals a Silmaril right out from underneath his nose. Amazing. Sam goes, and that was a blacker darkness than what we're in, I think. So in other words, maybe there's hope. And then all of a sudden, the light goes on in Sam's head. He goes, whoa, I just thought of something, Mr. Frodo. The light that was in that Silmaril that Baron stole all the way back in the first stage is the light that's in that little star glass that Galadriel gave you. To think of it, we're in the same story still. That's what he says. That little line, Tolkien understood what he was doing. Because he understands that we have not entered into the mythic significance of the story in which we're in, the primary story, the real story. We think Adam and Eve, Moses, all these people is another story. It's not another story. We're in the same story still. And he wants us to understand that. But it's easy to disengage from that story. And then what happens, ends up happening is we're just in a mere maintenance mode. We're not really engaged. We're not living here in light of this big arc. So the book of Acts, 28 chapters written down, but that story is still going on, is the church, the, the history of the church. And as I've said before, we could be in chapter 5,226. It's our chapter. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Tolkien wants you to know that. In conclusion, I want to end with Chesterton, who has done more to re-enchant my world than anybody else. This is in The Everlasting Man, and this is mythic in its import, and it's about the great change that Christ wrought. They took the body down from the cross, and one of the few rich men among the first Christians obtained permission to bury it in a rock tomb in his garden. The Roman setting a military guard lest they should be, there should be some riot and attempt to recover the body. There was once more a natural symbolism in these natural proceedings. It was well that the tomb should be sealed with all the secrecy of an ancient eastern sepulcher and guarded by the authority of the Caesars, for in that second cavern, that is where Christ is, the whole of that great and glorious humanity which we call antiquity was gathered up and covered over, and in that place it was buried. It was the end of a very great thing called human history, and the history that was merely human. The mythologies and the philosophies were buried there, the gods and the heroes and the sages. In the great Roman phrase, they had lived, but as they could only live, so they could only die, and they were dead. On the third day, the friends of Christ coming at daybreak to place, place found the grave empty and the stone rolled away. In varying ways, they realized the new wonder, but even they hardly realized that the world had died in the night. What they were looking at was the first day of a new creation, with a new heaven and a new earth, and in semblance of the gardener, God walked again in the garden, not in the cool uh, of the evening, but of the dawn. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.